classic. I, I love the story. Uh, you know, I think so many times we elevate these Bible characters to a different, like they're uh, 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 no longer human. They're superhuman. Maybe that's, and, and really they were just individuals like us. They were just human like us. Um, but I love the story about Daniel, so please forgive me. Your pastor told me, had said, when you come out, I want you to preach. And I'm thinking of all the other things I've got to do. I pastor a church. I work a job. He said, just pull something out, you know, that you've preached before. And and so forgive me, if I because I know Nathan's heard probably most of anything I've preached, and I know it to be uh, repetitious for him. But I felt it's what the Lord wanted me to uh, preach this morning. I'm going to talk about good guys finish first. Good guys in the kingdom of God really finish first. Uh, you know, the world would make you want to think that you've got to be less than honest in this world in order really to be first. But in God's kingdom, good guys really do finish first. And so that's what I'm calling this. But Daniel chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 1. And uh, then we're going to go to the book of First Timothy in the New Testament. Uh, Daniel chapter 6 and verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give account unto them, and the king should have no damage." Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. Notice that. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents and king of the kingdom the governors and the princes and the counselors and captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. And then we'll just, uh, we'll just leave it from there for sake of time. And then, um, as you know the story, he's cast into the lion's den for praying. And then let's go to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 4. 1 Timothy, chapter 4. It's in the New Testament, right before 2 Timothy, believe it or not, in case you have a hard time finding it. It's on page 1091 in my Bible, and uh, we're going to read verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And so for the next hour and a half, I want to talk about Good guy. He's finished first. You know I'm not long-winded. I'm not long-winded. Anyhow, give me a few minutes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you this morning for the privilege to stand before this congregation. Thank you for Brother and Sister Metzger, their ministry here, and their faithfulness, their dedication. And God, pray that you continue to bless them. Bless this church, we pray. Now, as we look into your word, we need the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. Give us a freedom and a liberty in this place. Give us open ears to hear and open hearts to receive from it. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good guys, finish first. And uh, uh, this, this is interesting because Daniel wasn't put in the lion's den for doing something wrong. He, you know, we associate, you do something wrong, you're going to be punished for it. Daniel was put in the lion's den for really for doing something that was right. That they all should have been doing. 
and he was doing something right. And so we just say, understand with wrong, with punishment, and with right, with becomes comes rewards, but it doesn't always work that way. But what's interesting with the, with this Persian empire, they were the epitome of their day of organization. They organized, they, they, I mean, it's just uh, to have all of these princes in charge of different places throughout the kingdom. And then they answered to the presidents who answered then to the king. And it was a real uh, uh, example of organization in this early day and, and, and of efficiency. But we reach this time in Daniel's life. Daniel is now 80 years old. He's no young man. He has climbed the political ladder, so to speak, and he becomes to the point where he is older than Darius, the king. Uh, Darius was 62 years old, and we find Daniel, his senior, at 80 years old. I don't know, so, and then it just goes on, as the story goes, and uh, you know, and we find that from that very first chapters where Daniel's a young man, and Daniel is put through the education, the University of Babylon, and he's trained, and he's trained in the ways of the Babylonians. He's taken captive from his homeland, brought there to a place he didn't want to be, separated from his family, but he's still serving God. He's still living for God separated from his family, but he's still dedicated to God. And I'll tell you, young people, that's a real lesson. You know, even if you're taking, you're, you're, you don't have anybody else, family's not watching, you know, or you realize, hey, God's still watching. God still sees. God knows. And so even when it came down to it, they could change Daniel's name, but they couldn't change his heart. They couldn't change his heart heart. And so by the time he reaches chapter 6, he's climbed this political ladder. He's a politician, folks. He really is. He's involved in politics. And it just lets you know that it's really not a whole lit, lot different than today's politics. It's just as corrupt, just as dirty, because when these princes set out and said, hey, we're going to bring Daniel down, is what this amounts to. We're going to get the scandal. We're going to get the scoop on Daniel. So we'll be able to say, oh, king, you know something? This Daniel isn't really who you think he is. This isn't the man because the king was going to set him, set Daniel above the others. And you know what? That breeds jealousy because they all think, oh, well, I'm more qualified than they are. I really should be the one that the king is looking at because I'm better than Daniel. That's kind of their mentality, what's going through their minds. And so they're jealous of him, and they set out to purposely find fault with him. Yeah. Not, let, not, not much different than today. <laughs> not a whole lot different, George, than what is today. <laughs> you know, but in, it, where I get to with this is, what about us in our Christian life? If there was enough evidence, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you of being a Christian? Would there be enough evidence in your life for somebody to come and say, yeah, he's a Christian. You can see it. We live in a day we need people to be genuine Christians. Not this phony stuff. We get enough of that. People see that on the Internet. They see that in the mega churches or whatever and all this stuff and they they do whatever they have to or, or say whatever they have to to please the people you know that's what happens in that but we need young people we need people to be genuine real christians we had a man that uh had spoke at church where we were attending years ago and he said something that's always stuck with me he said you know you better be a better christian tomorrow than you are today this is easy. We come together, we sing out of the songbook. We, well, we tried to. We tried to sing out of the songbook. I said, if Abby would have just held that microphone down a little bit, I could have read, read her lips while she was singing, and I would have known where we were at. But you know what? We come and we sing the songs, and we, we fellowship together, and we have a good time. This is easy. The challenge is tomorrow when we're not in church. It's easy to be a Christian when we're with other Christian people, but what when we're out in the world? That's when the challenge comes. You better be a better Christian tomorrow 
we are today. And so, you know, it just lets you know, no man's an island, somebody said. Our lives affect everybody else. Our, why, our lives are intertwined and people see whether we're genuine or not. They see that we're real. But I go back to verse four, because I think that uh, in, in Daniel chapter six and verse four, uh, and, and I think the wording here is interesting. He says, then the presidents and princes sought, they intended, they were determined to find occasion against Daniel. It's like they purposely set out. They decided among themselves, we're going to find the dirt on this man. We're going to do it. And in my imagination, since it's my sermon, and uh, I'm going to preach it my way, <laughs> whatever, without doing any disrespect for the scripture, but I just take it like maybe 30 of these princes said, you know what? We're going to watch Daniel at work. We're going to watch him at work because if we could catch him doing something at work, we could say, oh, king, you know what? This Daniel isn't the man you really think he is because we've been watching him at work. And we see how he works and we know he's not the man you think he really is. You know, I, I, I find out I, I work a factory job. Uh, I don't like it. <laughs> I just admit to you. I'm not happy there. I'm not a happy camper anymore, but you know what? I still try to do my best. Right. I still believe that Christians ought to be the best workers on the job. I believe you ought to be dependable. You ought to be trustworthy. You ought to be conscientious. You ought to punch in on time. You ought to work hard. You give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. Right. Come on, say amen or oh me, one or the other. You better have your steel-toed boots on this morning. I might be coming down where you live. I just think, you know what? If they'd have sought after, that, purposely set out, we'd be able to catch Daniel not clocking in on time. Daniel's taking an extra break, and he shouldn't be. Daniel's been, <laughs> you know, Dan, Daniel's just not the man you think he is, King. I just think Christians ought to be the best employees on the job. Amen really do. Years ago, I was working for a local funeral home. And the uh, funeral director, had, somebody came in and they paid on a bill. They laid down cash and several hundred dollars or whatever. And, and he came to me and said, Bob, this family, they came in and paid on this bill. And he said, I, I know it. I, 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 don't, I can't remember what I did with the money. I thought it was in the desk drawer. I can't remember. And he said, and I know you didn't take it. I thought, wow, at least I got by with that one. No, nah, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But you know what? If it was a compliment to me, he'd say, there's a person you can trust with your wallet. Come on. And I tried to be conscientious. I tried to be a good worker. I tried to be dependable and faithful in my job. Be trustworthy, folks. You ought to be the best person on your shift. And then I think there's, you know, moving on from that, I think there's another 30 of these princes in my thinking that all said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to watch him at home. We are going to watch Daniel at home because we'd be able to say, oh, king, this is not the man you think he is because we got 30 princes and we're watching his house. We're hiding behind the bushes. We're looking in the windows and we're about. Now, it's, it's pretty clear that Daniel probably didn't have a wife and probably didn't have children. But this is, I'm just putting this together because they'd be able to say, hey, you know what? At home, we caught him dragging his wife by, his, by her hair around the backyard. We caught him abusing his children. We've caught him doing that and be able to say, hey, king, he's not the man you think he is because we've been watching him at home. I really believe that there's ever a place on earth that ought to be a little bit like heaven. Ought to be the Christian home. There you go. Really ought to be the Christian home. It ought to be, you know, the people that you live with know you the best. They know that you're real. They know that you're a real Christian. Come on. They know how you are because they're with you the most. They know if you're just playing games with God. Come on. It's the people that you live with. There's a, it should be the Christian home that reflects whether there's something on the inside or not. 
And I understand not everybody gets along. My wife and I just admit that I'm not hard to get along with in our relationship. We've had our times of intense fellowship. We have. Come on, I'll be honest. We'll be honest. Come on. We've all been there. We have our moments of intense fellowship. And you know what? When two people think exactly alike, one of them's not necessary. None of us think exactly alike at home. My wife and I, we don't. You can, don't, don't ask Nathan. You could ask. I mean, you could ask our kids. Where's time? We come from two different backgrounds. God blends two different families together, two different ways of doing things of what you're used to. And you know, I've done, I've, I haven't done a lot of weddings. I've done a lot of funerals. I'd rather do 10 funerals than one wedding, I really would. Uh, the people I marry don't stay married. The ones I bury do pretty well stay buried. But uh, you know, I just, I, I've gotten to the point where, yeah, I'll do another funeral. Don't ask me to do another wedding because most of them have never stayed together. But I found, you know what I do from the very start, I insist on doing marriage counseling. And the very first thing I ask them is, where do you spend Christmas morning? Uh, just trying to get a fight going, just trying to talk them out of it. Oh, we're going to my parents. We've gone to my parents the last 25 years. We're going to my parents. I've always spent Christmas at my parents. And then the other was, oh no, we're going to my parents. Oh no, I've always been, you know something? It's a blending of two different families and a different way of doing Doing things. Right. You know something I still believe? The word of God is right when he says, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Man, you are the leader. You are the head of this covenant. I've taught my boys. I said, you know what? It, when you uh, enter into that marriage covenant, you become the high priest of your home. And a home cannot have two heads. Anything with more than one head is a monster. And it's got to be the husband, you're the head of the home. And wives, if you let him be the head of the home, you can't resist submitting yourself to him. There you go. When he treats you as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. This is so important. We never lived in a day that we have so much trouble in our families. And there's so much help. Books, videos, whatever, so much stuff that's written about the family. And we are in a time we have so many problems because people can't get along. It's a, how a Christian home should be a little bit, a little taste of heaven right here on earth. You know, I, I, I wonder about another thing is what kind of, maybe these princes and, 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 and presidents are all looking and saying, hey, if we could check through Daniel's mail. Whoa, if we could look through Daniel's emails, if we could check his texts, if we could look on his phone and we'd be able to say, oh, King, this Daniel is not the man you think he is because we've been watching him at home. Come on, come on. We say we're Christians. I ought to reflect on what we do in our homes, what we allow in our homes. When my kids were small, I didn't let them just put anything they wanted on their walls, in their bedroom. I own the walls. They're my walls. I own the air that they breathe in my house. I own it. It's mine. I just let them breathe it. It's mine. I let them know. There's just some things. Because, and growing up in a pastor's home, I did not allow. No, it's not going to happen here. Uh-uh. Not going to happen. I trained my boys when they were dating, and I, I think I might have told Nathan this. I don't. I know I did. Joel, they were dating, and I said, "Listen, son, it doesn't matter if she's got some Xbox or something in her bedroom. You do not go in her bedroom." There you go. When they were dating, I said, "You do not go in her bedroom." But if the door's open, doesn't hurt to look because the way she keeps her room is going to be the way she keeps house. <laughs> Just good advice right there. I said, hey, the way she, it doesn't hurt to look. But you know, you know what? I was trying to lay down some boundaries and said, this is what you don't do. Come on. And as Christians, we just don't allow. It's not going to happen. 
And when there's things that you do in public as couples, people wonder, what are they doing when nobody's looking? And I had to stop my voice at times and say, uh-huh, if you don't take care of it, I will. There you go. I'll deal with it. And it won't be pretty. There you go. But you know something, even when it comes to our kids, it ought to reflect that Christians live there. Come on. There's just some things we just don't allow. And listen, and our kids got a lot of, you know what? I just love this with so many kids here. And the Bible tells us children, listen, children, grandsons, where's my grand? It says children, obey your parents. Come on, parents. That, right. man, that's a good place to say amen. That's a great place to say amen. But I had to tell you, you know what? It, you got to listen to your parents, kids. Yeah. Bible says to all children, obey your parents that you may have a long life. You know what? Kids are abbreviating their life by disrespecting their parents. They are. You're cutting days off your life. When you disrespect your parents, you're cutting days off your life. It, was, it might, might be a little, a little far out, but I did it when Joel, I, th I don't think I did it for Nathan, but when Joel was reached a certain age and I, I was working for this funeral home at that time and they brought a girl that thought she could be her own boss, teenage girl, brought into the funeral home. Thought she could do her own thing. Thought she going to live my life. There ain't going to nobody tell me what to do. It's kind of the story behind it. I took my son Joel in and we sat there in the chapel at the funeral home. This girl all laid out. Nobody else was around. I said, this is what you think. When you think you can be your own boss, you can do your own thing and make your own rules and all that. And they found her laying in a side ditch down in Kentucky someplace. You know what? They bring her back in a body bag. When you think you can, don't have to listen. You know what? You're going to have an authority all through your life. You are. And don't you love it, these people? I'm going in the military, so I don't have to listen to mom and dad. And then you get a drill sergeant that says, I am your mother, I am your father, I am your girlfriend. Because they're going to go in there and say, I want to be my own boss. You know something? When you're out there driving your car and those lights, those blue lights come on and you, <laughs> they're your boss, you better pull over. You better pull over. You're going to have authority all your life. It starts with listening to your parents, kids. Children, obey your parents. In the Lord, this is right. Hey, Amen. This is good preaching. I might buy this tape myself, Nathan. Just kidding. Let me move on. Because I really think there's some other. I think, you know what? It, it, there was probably another group of these, what I have in the 30s, I think, another 30 princes that said, hey, we're going to watch his business dealings. Yeah. We're going to watch how Daniel conducts business, and then we'll be able to come back and say, oh, King Darius, this Daniel is not the man you think he is because we've been going around town, and we're finding he's leaving a bunch of unpaid bills wherever he goes. Mm-hmm. I believe Christians ought to be honest in their business dealings. Come on. In our town, we had a, one of these pizza places. And, and there on, on the counter, it said, do not accept checks from, and had a whole list of people. One was a local pastor in our area. That bothers me because I are one. It wasn't me. And don't ask me to tell. Wild horses couldn't drag it out of me. You wouldn't even know who it was anyhow. But maybe. But anyhow, but you know what? We need to be Christians when it comes to our business dealings. Yeah. It was said in under Billy Sunday's ministry when he preached and went in a, and held a crusade in a certain town, they knew there was something going on when the bars started to close down and people started to pay their bills. Right, right. Wow, what a testimony. You know, I found out we just have to live within our means. If you can't afford it, maybe you don't need it. You know that? It'd be nice to have that new Ferrari, but if you can't afford it, maybe you don't need it. Come on. We need to be Christians in our business dealings. I worked for a man who was on the bank board and uh, a certain bank, and he said, you know what? We hate as a bank board to see pastors 
and churches come through the door wanting a bank loan. Number one, bad risk. Sad. Thank God our church was paid off early. I'm waiting for the time to be able to tell him that. I'm waiting. Though the right time is going to come open. I'll say, you know what? Our church is paid off early. We didn't even go to your bank. Neener, neener, neener. Because we weren't going to your bank. Just because he told me that, we weren't going to go to that bank. We got to be Christians in our business dealings. I know of a man who wanted to go around our, our community, give his testimony. I got a testimony. I want to give my testimony and all this. And he came, he left a house. He was renting and took furniture that didn't belong to him, left piles of trash that had to be cleaned up, and didn't pay all his rent. And I'm going to go around and give my testimony and tell what God has done for me. What a, you know, how great a testimony I have. And you know how I know it's true? Is because I cleaned up the mess. I hold out the bag of trash. You know what? That's a poor testimony. Right. Yes. Yes. Christians ought to be honest in our business dealings. Really should. Let me move on. Now I'm going to close. I believe there's another group, These, however many I had left that I didn't use for the other three points, two points, three points. I believe there's some that were watching Daniel's character. And going to say, oh, King Darius, we're watching his character. We're watching how you wouldn't believe how Daniel gets under. He is under stress and he gets mad and he gets angry. And some of the language that Daniel uses, oh, King, he's not the man you think he is. You know something, when it comes to our character, I think our character ought to reflect that we're Christians too. You know why? Because he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows. God knows everything about you. God knows the very thoughts and the intents of your heart. God knows he thinks you think that, that I'm boring this morning. You can't wait till I sit down, shut up, and we can thinking that, but God knows. God knows everything about you. God knows the number of the hairs of her head. And for some, it's more than others. But you know what? He knows everything about you. Somehow, as Christians, we begin to forget that. As in the town that I pastor in, that's my reputation. They know who Bob Jeffries is. But character is who I am when the lights are off and nobody's looking. And it's just me and God. It's character. When nobody else is around, character is what you and God know you as. What about us? What about my vocabulary? What about the things that I say? I know they're, they're at work. There's a time. To, you know, people have a way of just pushing your buttons. And I know there's some people just waiting for me to fly off the handle and say some choice words that aren't normally in my vocabulary. Come on. It happens. I remember coming home from school with a whole new vocabulary, and I got a bar of soap in my mouth. And it taught me that there were some words that you, that you just don't say. And my mother would look at me. She's just a little lady, just a little tiny lady. And she'd say, if you don't hear me say it, you don't say it. Come on. You don't say it. You don't hear me say it. We've got to be Christians when it comes to our character. What we are in the dark when nobody else is looking. What about your actions? What about the way you conduct yourself? Come on. I know some Christians are so bitter. They're so angry. When they talk about being baptized in pickle juice, you know, they're just so bitter. I think, you know, Christians... It's like one preacher said, Christians have more fun accidentally than sinners do on purpose. I don't know about you. I know some, things, some days aren't, aren't good. I just have some days that are better than other days. You know? It doesn't mean I'm not living in some fairy tale land. I know what it's like. I get under stress. But it doesn't mean we have to lose our salvation. I've got to be a Christian when it comes to my character. Who I am on the inside Sure, I work with some people that I, I'd really like to tell them what I think. I'd really like to fly off the handle sometimes. But what's that do to my testimony? I've told the, uh, my grandson's a 
I do a little bit of sandblasting and I, I gave them a stone with their name on it. And so it Seth says Seth. Andrew says Andrew. And and my grandson's no, but on the back of it says Proverbs chapter twenty two verse one. What's it say? What's Proverbs twenty two one? Good name. It's rather to be chosen. Great riches. Keep a good name. It just takes what you could build a good name for years and years and you can destroy it in minutes. In minutes. Tear down everything you've built for years. Let me let me go on real quick and then I'll close. This is I always have a lot of closings. People like the closing the best, so I always have long closing. And uh, I guess they like that the best. But you know what? All this goes back to Brother Massacre. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart. He wouldn't defile himself. The king's meat. He could have had all the luxury of Babylon. Oh, man, the best food, the best desserts, best everything. Sweet tea. All oh, the stuff that he liked, you know. I just think he was a sweet tea drinker. And everything he liked, Daniel would have had it all. But he said, I'll not defile myself. A purpose in his heart. A purpose in his heart that went from the time he was a teenager clear to when he was in the 80s. He never lost sight of it. Amazing. But he purposed in his heart. So what did they find? We can't find any case. No fault. This man's fault. Did it mean he was perfect? No. He's still human. But we can't find it unless it's concerning his God. And they come up with this God of the month club. They said, oh, king, nobody prays to you or uh, prays to any other God but you for the whole 30 days. Nobody. You know, ain't going to pray to anybody else. Then we'll get Daniel. They knew he was faithful to pray. And they caught him, put him in the lion's den. And then, you know, isn't it amazing? You see a reversal of destinies. Daniel is pulled up out of the lion's den and those rest of his accusers were all put in the lion's den and torn to shreds by those lions. Good guys really do finish first. Do. He wasn't put in the lion's den for doing something wrong. He was put there for doing something right. You know what? I'm going to ask for every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. I know we've hit a lot of things. But what about you? What about you this morning? If you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? What about the areas of your life? And I don't need to know what it is, but maybe you'd say, yeah, Brother Jeffries, it's something that's me. I need to make the change. I need to make the change. The Holy Spirit spoke to me, and there's areas of my life that I just know I've fallen short in. I need God's help. I need to work on. And you want to slip your hand up and down when no one's looking, and you say, yeah, that's me. That's me. I need the courage to make the change. Anybody at all? Anyone at all? Thank you. Thank you. I acknowledge there's an area of my life that I just know that I fall short in. I just need God's help. Thank you. Thank you. There's just let me let me just share one more illustration and it's a story about a man he was a surgeon and and he had back in the early 1900s and he was a top surgeon of this one hospital and and he he really felt like with local anesthesia he could do surgery on himself and this man took out his own appendix this surgeon he just local anesthesia cut himself took out his appendix sewed himself back up you know what? Sometimes the Holy Spirit puts his finger on something and says, you take care of this. It means you do the surgery. You do the work. The Holy Spirit reveals it. He's like a mirror and reveals it to us and says, hey, this is where you're missing something. Now, with his help, deal. Work on it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, oh, we thank you for your word this morning. We know that your word is truth. May your word penetrate the hardest heart here and help us, Lord. You see that.